Let's imagine that bainite forms exactly like martensite without any diffusion, not even of carbon, right? So we begin with a plate like this, which has exactly the same composition as the austenite, but we are forming bainite at a high temperature, so the carbon quickly escapes into the austenite, and then it precipitates as cementite. So we end up with a microstructure which is upper bainite. If you now reduce the transformation temperature a little, then the diffusion of carbon becomes slower. We precipitate some cementite inside the plates, and then we precipitate some between the plates, and that's our lower bainite microstructure. Now, how can we prove that this is the real mechanism? Because carbon can diffuse very rapidly. So by the time we do an experiment, things might have changed, right? Well, here is a calculation of the time required for the carbon to escape, escape from the plate, right? So as a function of temperature. And this is in seconds. So this is one second, this is two seconds. And this is temperature going from 300 to 500 degrees centigrade. You can see that even if it forms exactly like martensite, carbon can escape very quickly afterwards. So by the time we come to do an experiment, it will have changed. So this is a very serious problem because we can't do an experiment in a quarter second after bainite forms. And we need to know whether it is truly a diffusionless transformation or whether carbon partitions during transformation. Okay. Now, I'm going to introduce you to some thermodynamics. And this is really important because later on we will use exactly this to design a very tough steel. Okay? So it's very important to understand the concept that I'm going to introduce and ask questions if you don't follow this. Okay? Now this is the free energy curve of ferrite and the free energy curve of austenite as a function of carbon at a constant temperature T1. All right? So this kind of a curve you can obtain very easily using the software that I described is available freely on our website or of course you can use thermocalc or empty data or faxage or commercial software okay? which you have in POSDEC and many places. So you can calculate how the free energy of austenite and of ferrite changes with carbon concentration very easily and that the top part of the diagram is for a constant temperature and the normal way in which thermocalc and empty data and so forth they calculate the equilibrium phase diagram is they draw a tangent to these two curves okay? and the point over here extrapolated on the temperature versus carbon plot gives me the AE1 phase boundary okay? And this point here gives me the AE3 phase boundary of the iron carbon phase diagram. But I don't want to look at those equilibrium phase boundaries. I want you to focus on another part of this diagram. This green point here, where austenite and ferrite of the same chemical composition have the same energy. Okay? Now, why am I interested in that point? Why am I interested in this point? Well, if I take austenite of this composition here and I transform it to ferrite of the same composition, then there is an increase in free energy. That is impossible. Okay? Thermodynamically, that is impossible. So, if I have a carbon concentration in the austenite, which is more than this green point, then I cannot obtain diffusionless transformation. Full stop. Okay, it's impossible. On the other hand, if I have austenite of this composition, less than the green point, and I transform it to ferrite of the same composition, there's a reduction in free energy. So it's possible, in principle, to get diffusionless transformation. Okay? Now, if I take this green point and I plot it on my phase diagram, I get a curve which is known as the T0 curve. The T0 curve here. On this side, 
the austenite has a composition which cannot transform without diffusion. Okay? On this side, it is possible for the austenite to transform without diffusion. Okay? So is everybody happy with the T0 concept? In principle, it's very simple. If your austenite carbon concentration exceeds T0, it's impossible to get diffusion-less transformation. Okay. We can use this information now to investigate bainite. So let's imagine that we have an alloy which has a carbon concentration given by this line here, X bar. Okay. We form a plate of bainite without any diffusion. But the temperature is high, so the carbon then escapes into the austenite, so it escapes. So the austenite becomes richer in carbon. So the next plate of bainite has to form from austenite, which is richer in carbon. It then partitions carbon, and so on. But this cannot happen once we go, once the austenite carbon concentration reaches the T0 line. So the transformation will be stopped as soon as the austenite composition reaches the T0 phase boundary. Okay? So if bainite is truly a diffusion-less transformation, but carbon partitions afterwards, then it can only progress until you hit the T0 curve. Okay? On the other hand, if carbon diffuses during transformation, then this reaction will continue until the austenite composition reaches the A3 phase boundary. Okay. And the difference between this and this is very large. So if we measure the composition at the point where bainite stops, then we should be able to decide whether it's a diffusion-less transformation or whether it's an equilibrium transformation which can continue until the A3 phase boundary. Okay. And when you do experiments, there's absolutely no doubt where the reaction stops. It stops at the T0 boundary rather than the equilibrium boundary, which is far away. Okay? So the difference between the A3 composition and the T0 is very large. And I will show you so many examples of where the T0 curve is now used in the design of commercial steels. Okay? So is everybody happy with that concept? Well, uh, why don't we have a five-minute break? Yeah? Okay. Again? So, just to uh, explain again, the bainite reaction stops when the austenite reaches the T0 composition rather than the composition given by the equilibrium phase boundary. Okay? And that is a very, very big effect. The difference between here and here is very large in terms of uh, the composition of the austenite. So, you can use this T0 curve to actually calculate the composition of the austenite at the point where the bainite reaction stops. And of course the consequence of this is that as you raise the transformation temperature you get less and less bainite. So here at 471 degrees centigrade we've got very little bainite and as you lower the transformation temperature you get a lot more bainite. The, the reason is of course you can form more bainite at a lower temperature because the T0 composition is greater. Okay? Uh, and you get to a particular point where no bainite will form even though you are at a low temperature. So for example in this particular steel at 500 degrees centigrade you will not get any bainite. If the reaction was controlled by the A3 curve then you could of course get bainite even at much higher temperatures. So this phenomenon is known as the incomplete reaction phenomenon because it doesn't go to the equilibrium phase boundary. It stops at the T0 phase boundary. Okay? So the volume fraction of bainite that is possible will always be less than equilibrium. Okay? Of course, if you remove carbon from the austenite, then the reaction can go further. Okay? And the one way of removing the carbon is by precipitating cementite. And if you look at time temperature transformation diagrams, this is a very old one from Zener's days, uh, then you can see that the bainite C curves are quite different from those for ferrite and perlite. They're quite different in the sense that it doesn't matter how long I hold at this temperature, I will not get more than 50% transformation. 
Here, if I hold, I continue, I can go to 100% transformation. Okay? So it has a, this T0 curve has a very big effect on all aspects of bainite, including the time temperature transformation diagram. So you can see this behavior is very similar to that of martensite. But if I quench to martensite here, but I don't go down in temperature, I will not get more martensite. Yeah. I have to cool further to get more martensite. So we still need to explain the detailed difference between martensite and bainite, and I will come back to that later. Now, you know that this is uh, an ordinary trip assisted steel that you use in automobile manufacture, where you have about 70 or 80 percent of ferrite, allotromorphic ferrite, and the remainder is a mixture of austenite and bainite. Okay. And the austenite is retained because the bainite transformation partitions carbon, and therefore the austenite has a concentration which is of the order of uh, something like 1.2 weight percent. Okay. And for exactly that steel, you can see that you can predict the carbon concentration of austenite simply by modeling the T0 curve. Okay. So this is for a trip-assisted steel. If you assume that it's an equilibrium or a diffusional transformation, you would get very wrong answers. You would say that the austenite has 4 weight percent of carbon. And nobody has ever found 4 weight percent of carbon in the austenite. Okay? If you look at hundreds of papers, it's of the order of 1.2 weight percent because of the T0 curve. So you can use this simple calculation to work out the composition of the austenite. And of course the T0 curve is influenced by other elements like silicon and manganese even though they don't diffuse the effect the free energy curves so you can change the position of the T0 curve by altering the other elements. Okay, the, uh, what is the other consequence of the fact that the growth of bainite is diffusionless? Well, first of all, if we look at plates of bainite forming, they should grow much faster than controlled by the diffusion of carbon. Yeah? So the sequence of images that I'm going to show you are taken at one second intervals to look at bainite growing. Okay? So if you focus on, on this region here, you will see some plates of bainite growing. And this is a technique called photoemission electron microscopy where we have high resolution and we can actually see the transformation happening. And I will show you the sequence of images at one second interval. So one second later, you've, you can see these three plates of bainite have grown here, here, and here. And yeah, so we can actually measure the growth rate of bainite and we can show that it is three orders of magnitude faster than would be allowed by the diffusion of carbon. The next uh, outcome is that given that growth is diffusionless and we have a shape deformation, in any calculation of growth you must take account of strain energy as well. Okay? And you remember this slide which I showed earlier where I proposed why we get a difference between upper bainite and lower bainite. You can model this quantitatively. So you can predict the change from upper bainite to lower bainite as you alter the transformation temperature. And when, when we were creating this model, we, the model predicted something very strange. And here is the prediction from the model. And I, I told my student to go away and think again because it doesn't seem right. What it predicted was that there is a very narrow range of carbon in plain carbon steels where I start from perlite I go to upper bainite, to lower bainite, and then martensite. But if I have a carbon concentration less than this value, then I go from perlite to upper bainite and to martensite. There should be no lower bainite. Whereas, you know, all the textbooks will tell you that as I lower the transformation temperature, I go from perlite to lower bainite to upper bainite to martensite. According to this prediction, if in plain carbon steel the concentration is less than 0 0.3, weight percent, I will not get lower bainite. And of course, if I have a concentration greater than about 0.4, I will go from perlite directly to lower bainite and then to martensite. There will be no upper bainite. 
So I couldn't believe this calculation. Anyway, we thought and thought, and the model kept on predicting this diagram. There were no mistakes that we could find. And then eventually we found experimental data to support this. So here is uh, uh, some data published by Oka and Okamoto in another study, where they started at 0 0.6. And you go directly from perlite, uh, perlite to lower bainite to martensite. There is no upper bainite in these alloys. Okay. And then Omori and Honeycomb many years ago published this diagram, where if you look at less than 0 0.3 weight percent, you go from perlite to upper bainite to martensite. Okay. So it isn't the case that in all steels you will get upper bainite and lower bainite. If your carbon concentration is low so that the carbon can escape quickly from the plate, you will not get precipitation inside the plate and you will not get lower bainite. If your carbon concentration is very high, then there is time for the cementite to precipitate and you will only get lower bainite. Okay. So, what I've tried to show you is that there is a consistent set of experimental data which supports that bainite growth is diffusionless, but the carbon then escapes from the plate of bainite. So it's like tempering. It's, it's like tempering happening during the transformation itself. So just to summarize, uh, there's no question about the mechanism of transformation. It is displacive. You can see with your own eyes the displacements that bainite forms, uh, bainite causes. The transformation temperature is higher than martensite. I haven't explained that clearly. I will do that towards the end of this lecture. Okay. It grows without diffusion and that has a major consequence on industrial steels because the transformation stops at T0 when you prevent the precipitation of cementite. Uh, the carbon escapes into the austenite very rapidly after diffusionless transformation. And one other major consequence is that the bainite is forming at higher temperatures than martensite, so it plastically deforms the austenite, and therefore the plates grow to a limited size. And that's very good because we get a, a mechanism for grain refinement. You know, instead of having coarse plates of martensite, we have very, very fine plates of bainite. And that gives us this subunit mechanism of growth where a plate grows stops itself, you have to nucleate another one, another one, another one, and so on. And all of this can be expressed quantitatively. So what I want you to do is, I want you to think of bainite as martensite, which tempers itself very rapidly during the course of transformation. So these are just micrographs of tempered martensite, and you can show that every crystallographic feature that you find in tempered martensite is exactly the same in bainite. Okay? Now, going back to uh, optical microscopy, you know, how do we distinguish bainite from martensite? Well, I showed you some very clear examples where the bainite etches darker. Okay? This is a less clear example where I was presented with this microstructure and said, what is this? Okay. Well, even in this, you can clearly see regions which are etching light. Okay. And those are the regions of martensite because the martensite doesn't have these cementite particles. So it etches light. And this is bainite. And one more thing uh, which tells me that this is not perlite is that, look, I can see some crystallography here. These are in the form of plates. Okay, so when you look at these images, uh, look for these straight lines here, which are indications of plates forming. If these were like spheres, then that would be perlite. And the light etching regions are the ones you should look at to see whether you have these straight edges corresponding to the crystallography of bainite. Okay? So it's easy if you have a mixed microstructure to spot what is bainite and what is martensite simply from the etching characteristics in optical microscopy. And then if you like, you can do some transmission electron microscopy or scanning electron microscopy. But in scanning electron microscopy, the images can be confusing because you don't have the same sort of etching behavior. Okay, uh, so I've talked about completely diffusionless transformation, which is martensite, and I've talked about bainite, which is diffusionless, but the carbon escapes. 
Okay? And I want you to imagine these, this mechanism of, these two mechanisms of transformation slightly differently. Here we deform the austenite to produce the transformation product. Here we break all the bonds and simply rearrange the atoms without changing the external shape. Okay? This is how I want you to think about the transformation. Supposing that we have a queue of soldiers here. Okay? And they have their names. Uh, in this case it's uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. When the military transport arrives, they all board the bus in the exact sequence. So you know that this atom here came exactly from this position here. You have a memory of where the atoms were in the parent phase. Of course, this is why we can create a shape memory alloy from martensite, because it remembers where the atoms were in the parent phase. Okay? So it's a highly disciplined movement of atoms. And atom number two must be close to atom number three, even if they don't like each other. Yeah? They have no choice. They are trapped in that scenario. So there's a lot of strain energy here. It's not an equilibrium transformation. If you look at ferrite and perlite, then it's like this. We have a queue of civilians. As soon as the bus arrives, they rush and they sit next to their friends. So there is very little strain energy. But we've lost all the atomic correspondence. Okay? So this is closer to an equilibrium transformation. Now there is a third kind of transformation. So this is a civilian transformation. We had a military transformation. What is between civilian and military? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's like a paramilitary, right? <laughs> and paramilitary is when we have a mixture of small atoms and large atoms. Yeah? So the large atoms will board the bus in a highly disciplined way. But these little atoms here will occupy the positions where they want to be. Okay? So it is possible to get a situation in which the small atoms diffuse but the large atoms are displaced. And that's the next phase transformation that we have to understand. And that's the wiedmann sarden ferrite here. wiedmann sarden ferrite grows at a temperature above T0. So there is no way that it can be diffusionless. It is thermodynamically impossible for it to be diffusionless. And the microstructure looks like this. Uh, this is what we call primary wheatman sarden ferrite growing directly from the austenite grain boundaries and sometimes it nucleates on ferrite layers. And it has this characteristic shape which is like a thin wedge. Okay? It is a coarse microstructure. Look at the scale over there. It's 20, 20 micrometers and you can see this is wheatman sarden ferrite and this is martensite. Now notice the etching behavior. It's completely clean. Yeah, it's not dark like the bainite that I showed you, which was etching black. Here it's etching beautifully clean white. There's no structure inside those plates. Okay? And it is very coarse. It's about, uh, you know, on an optical scale, this is a few micrometers thick. Right? And generally speaking, in, in a strong steel, this is a bad microstructure to have because of its coarseness. You know, a crack can go across a packet of Wiedmann-Stan ferrite without much deflection, right? So optically, it's easy to distinguish from bainite. You won't see any structure inside the plate, and it will etch very light. So why does this happen? Well, uh, of course, uh, the micrograph I'm showing you here is a nice, neat micrograph of partial transformation, and this is how it would look like in a commercial seal, where Again, uh, this scale is 100 micrometers here, you can see. These are plates of Wiedmann-Stan ferrite, you can see they are clean, okay? They etch perfectly white. And these are the layers of allotriomorphic ferrite from which they are growing. The rest of this is perlite. Now, supposing we do the same experiment for Wiedmann-Stan ferrite, that we polish a sample of austenite completely flat, and allow it to form. Then we see a shape deformation. So these are two different ways of observing. This is uh, uh, Tolensky interference fringes. You can see that they are displaced, a shear deformation. And these are scratches, which again you can see are displaced. But what I'd like you to notice is that uh, here we have a shear deformation and here we have an opposite 
shear. Okay? Now, Wiedemann's and ferrite forms at high temperatures where the driving force for transformation is quite small. So you can't tolerate a lot of strain energy. So what's really happening is that two plates are growing together and cancelling out each other's shear. Okay? So this is not, uh, not like, like this, where we have just one plate, but we have two plates growing together, compensating for each other's shear deformation. And that is the reason why the shape is like this, because these two plates are different crystallographic variants of the same habit plane. Okay? So by growing together, they cancel out each other's strain energy. But of course, there is a cost associated with this, is that you have to nucleate the two plates at the same time. And the probability of that happening is small, and that's why you get a coarse microstructure. You don't nucleate many plates. Yeah. You have to simultaneously nucleate two plates which will cancel each other's shape deformation. So this will always be a coarse microstructure. And this is a paramilitary transformation. <coughs> that means the crystal structure change is achieved by displacement. We can see the displacement. But carbon must diffuse. There's no way that carbon can be supersaturated inside the Wiedemann-Stein ferrite. It's above the T0 temperature. Therefore, the plates will grow at a rate which is controlled by the diffusion of carbon in the austenite ahead of the interface. And indeed, uh, oh, by the way, this is a, a transmission electron micrograph of what appears to be a single plate of Wiedemann-Stein ferrite, but actually it's two plates which cancel each other's shape deformation. Okay. And when you measure the growth rate of Wiedemann-Stein ferrite, you can predict it by assuming carbon diffusion controlled growth. Okay? So this is truly a paramilitary transformation in which the crystal structure is changed by a deformation but at a rate controlled by the diffusion of carbon. Okay, so to summarize, for, for Wiedemann sand ferrite, the mechanism is displacive, but there's no reason why a displacive transformation should happen rapidly. It occurs at a rate controlled by the diffusion of carbon in austenite. Yeah, we can get martensite forming very slowly in appropriate alloys. Uh, pairs of plates grow together to minimize strain energy. And all of this goes into our computer algorithms, which allow you to distinguish clearly between Wiedemann sand ferrite, bainite, martensite, etc. Okay, now, uh, uh, now there is going to be some complicated stuff because we have to think about nucleation, right? And nucleation is much more difficult than growth because we can't observe very tiny particles forming, okay? So we ha I'm going to present to you now the ideas about the nucleation of all of the phases that I described earlier. And there is a very clear story, but it might be a little bit difficult. So, again, looking at these free energy curves, we have the free energy curve of ferrite and of austenite at a particular temperature. And supposing that we have diffusion-less transformation of this austenite into this austenite, then this is the free energy change for diffusion-less growth. Okay? So I'm using that terminology to define diffusion-less growth. Now, when nucleation happens, even if there is some diffusion, the amount of nucleus is very tiny. Yeah? It's it may be a hundred atoms or so. So even if there is partitioning of alloying elements and so forth, you don't see a change in the composition of the austenite. Yeah? So nucleation hardly influences the composition of the austenite. So the free energy change for nucleation is greater. It's given by this term here. Okay? So I will use this terminology to define the free energy change for nucleation and this one for growth. So you don't need to worry about details except that we have more free energy available at the nucleation stage than at the growth stage because the composition of the austenite doesn't change during nucleation significantly. So here we have our 
time temperature transformation diagram. The upper C curve represents diffusional transformations, the ferrite and the perlite. And at the moment, I'm not dealing with those. I'm more interested in the lower C curve, which is for Wiedemann Staden ferrite, lower bainite, upper bainite. Okay? And that curve has a flat top. Right? You cannot get those transformations above the temperature TH over there. And that temperature, it could be Wiedemann Staden ferrite, it could be bainite. We have to decide that. All right? So for every steel, I can find a time temperature transformation diagram like that. Yeah, here. And I'm going to calculate the free energy that's available at the temperature TH for that steel. So this is the free energy change in going from austenite to ferrite for a given steel, for which this is the TTT diagram. And at the temperature TH, it has a particular value here, okay, whatever that value is. So that single point represents the free energy change for that steel at the top of the C curve for bainite and Wiedemann Stan ferrite. Now I can take another steel because there are many, many TTT diagrams available in the literature and do the same analysis and I will get another point here and another point and another point and so on. By taking many, many time temperature transformation diagrams, I can work out how the free energy at the temperature TH depends on alloy composition. Yeah? And those green points give me the minimum free energy that's required to nucleate these transformations. So here is an analysis of those green points. And it's done in two different ways. One is that there is no diffusion during nucleation. Right? And the other one, I'm allowing carbon to partition during nucleation. So this is the case where I'm allowing carbon to partition and each point is a different steel. Okay. And this is where I'm assuming that there is no diffusion during nucleation. And the lower one, lower graph, is impossible because some of the points have a positive free energy change. So my conclusion is that I cannot get the nucleation of these phases, Wiedemann, Sand, Ferrite and Bainite, without the partitioning of carbon. The upper curve over there, all the points have a reduction in free energy, which is necessary if you want transformation. So my conclusion is that to nucleate Wiedemann, Sand, Ferrite and Bainite, I must have partitioning of carbon. Okay? The other interesting thing is that that is a straight line within, within experimental error, that is a straight line. And we need to explain that straight line because I might want to design a steel which has a bainite transformation temperature of room temperature. Yeah? Or I might want to find out what is the lowest temperature at which I can get bainite. So we need to explain why that is a straight line. But we can conclude that there must be partitioning of carbon during the nucleation stage. Now, martensite is completely diffusionless. It doesn't require any partitioning of carbon. So that is the key difference between martensite and bainite. That in bainite, you must have partitioning of carbon during nucleation. Okay? And that slows the reaction down compared with martensite, which is completely diffusionless. Okay, so the nucleation of bainite must involve the partitioning of carbon. But why does the required free energy change vary linearly with temperature? In other words, why is this a straight line? Should it be a straight line? By investigating whether it should be a straight line, we might discover something about the mechanism of nucleation. Now, I'm going to discuss this in terms of hexagonal ion, the epsilon ion, rather than austenite because uh, rather than the ferrite, because ferrite is a complicated crystal structure, but the relationship between austenite and epsilon ion is very easy. Yeah? You know, austenite you can think about as a stacking of layers of close packed atoms. So this is austenite, and if you look at these 111 planes of austenite, then they are like balls stacked together, close packed. 
and I can generate the whole crystal structure of osnite by stacking these layers in the sequence ACB, ACB, A. In other words, uh, this layer of atoms, this layer of atoms sits on the holes on this, and then this sits on the holes on this, and that gives me a repeat period of three, so I have ACB, ACB, A. That's austenite. That's the face-centered cubic structure of austenite. Hexagonal iron is very similar, except it's A, B, A, B, A, B stacking of the same layers. Here you go. So A, B, A, B, A, B stacking. So to change from austenite to epsilon iron is very simple. I, I just shift these layers into A positions. Okay? And that happens, in reality, by the movement of dislocations. Shockley partial dislocations, which change the stacking sequence from ABC, ABC to AB, AB. So if we are nucleating epsilon martensite in austenite, then we should be able to see that nucleation process as simply the dissociation of dislocations into Shockley partials. Okay? So when in a transmission electron microscope you see a stacking fault, that is a thin layer of epsilon ion. So in a transmission electron microscope, a stacking fold looks like this, okay? And it's a, it's a three-layer thick region of epsilon ion. Okay. That is the nucleus for epsilon martensite in austenite. It's simply the dissociation of an A by 2, 1, 1, 0 dislocations into two Shockley partial dislocations, okay? And the really interesting thing is that the density of epsilon ion is not the same as that of austenite. Okay? It's, it's actually more dense than austenite, and that's why it forms at high pressures. Yeah? Because when you apply pressure, the more dense phase is favored. And a stacking fault doesn't have a volume change, you know, it's just a dislocation shearing. But look at that second image there. here, which is taken using an imaging condition which cancels out the shear. Okay? <coughs> and you can still see the stacking fault because of the volume change. All right? So this truly is the nucleus of martensite, of epsilon martensite in austenite. We not only have the shear, but we also have the volume change. Okay? So this, this is a beautiful experiment done in 1979 which proves that this stacking fault is actually a nucleus of martensite. Okay? Now, the same observation for ferrite is much, much, much more difficult because you cannot simply change austenite into ferrite by a shear. It's a more complicated deformation. I explained to that, you know, the Bain strain plus other deformations. But, so it, it's more complicated. And I don't want to go into details but the essence of it is the same. That look, we have, we have a dislocation which dissociates and in between it creates the ferrite crystal structure. All right? So the mechanism of nucleation is the same in going from austenite to ferrite as austenite to epsilon ion. Dissociation of dislocations. So we ought to be able to create a theory for martensite, uh, bainite, and Wiedemann-Sand ferrite nucleation based on dissociation of dislocations. And the, the beauty of these displacive transformations is that we actually have seen the nuclei. Yeah? Nobody has seen the nuclei for ferrite and for perlite yeah, at the very early stages. With this, you know, we actually have evidence for the nucleation process. Okay, so let's imagine how we can model this nucleation process. We have uh, dislocations here, which used to be one dislocation, but it is splitting into several dislocations, and in between it's creating the ferrite. Okay? You can write down the energy of this fault as the change in the chemical free energy in going from austenite to ferrite. That is what is driving the dissociation. But of course, there will be some strain associated because that causes a deformation, so there's this strain energy. And then we have a surface being created. So this is the surface energy per unit area. So that is the energy of the fault. 
But you can also think about dislocations in terms of a stress, yeah, not just a chemical free energy change. You can, you can imagine the process of dissociation being driven by a stress. Okay? So the second equation gives you what would happen if you apply the shear stress of Tor, and these are the Burgers vectors of the dislocations, and this is the number of dislocations involved. So all I have to do now is to use dislocation theory to work out the activation energy because when you move a dislocation from one position to another it has to go over a barrier. Yeah, it, the crystal structure itself presents a barrier called the Piles barrier and that activation energy here, whoops, yeah, here is for the movement of dislocations. Right? So it has a constant value, but if you apply a stress, then the activation energy decreases because you help the dislocation to move. Right? So I now simply substitute for this stress here into this equation, and I get the activation energy for nucleation as a function of the chemical driving force and the basic activation energy for dislocation movement inside austenite. Yeah? Now that activation energy, of course, can be measured from deformation experiments on austenite. The activation energy for the movement of a dislocation from one position in the lattice to another. Okay. And we also have the chemical free energy change. And the very interesting thing that comes out of this theory is that this is linearly proportional to this. Okay. So if I now use my nucleation rate equation where this is a, an attempt frequency and this is the activation energy, then I recover from that, that the driving force over here will depend linearly on the temperature. Okay? So I now actually have physical justification for that straight line, based on actually observations of nuclei. Yeah? So this is possibly the most physical model for nucleation in steels. We don't have any information about the nucleation uh, observations on nucleation mechanisms for ferrite or for perlite. But for displacive transformations, the straight line is actually justified. I, and notice that it only goes down to 400 degrees centigrade. But in tomorrow's lectures, I'm going to extrapolate it to zero Kelvin. Because I now know that I'm justified in doing that. I have an equation which tells me that should be a straight line. Yeah? So the most important thing, uh, don't worry about the details, most important thing is that the mechanism of nucleation involves the dissociation of dislocations and that predicts that the driving force for nucleation, the, the minimum driving force that I need at this temperature, Th, is linearly dependent on Th and this curve is like a universal nucleation function. I can use it to predict the temperature Th for any steel. Yeah. All I need to do is work out at what temperature do we reach that particular free energy and I've got the temperature Th. And that's how we calculate time temperature transformation diagrams. Okay. So the nucleation mechanism for Wiedmann-Sand ferrite, bainite is the same. Whether the nucleus develops into bainite or Wiedmann-Sand ferrite depends on how much driving force is available for growth. If diffusion-less growth is possible, then we get bainite. But if diffusion-less growth is impossible, we are above the T0 temperature, then the same nucleus develops into Wiedmann-Sand ferrite. Okay. So nucleation involves the partitioning of carbon for bainite and Wiedmann-Sand ferrite. If you are above the T0 temperature, that nucleus will develop into Wiedmann-Sand ferrite. If you are below the T0 temperature, it will develop into bainite. If nucleation is diffusionless, we get martensite. Yeah. So we have a clear scheme for predicting all of the transformations consistently based on the atomic mechanisms of nucleation and growth. Okay. And not only that, but that scheme explains the different shapes that we observe. You know, Wiedmann-Stan ferrite is coarse and a very clean microstructure, bainite very fine microstructure, and so on. The upper bainite, the lower bainite, etc. 
Uh, if you use classical nucleation theory, then it predicts a completely different dependence of activation energy on the chemical driving force. It's like this instead of like this, okay? So it doesn't explain that straight line that we observed. So to summarize, the nucleation of bainite must involve the partitioning of carbon. So when we calculate the driving force for nucleation, we calculate it allowing for carbon to partition between the nucleus and the austenite. And the mechanism of nucleation otherwise is the same as that of martensite. Uh, dissociation of dislocations because that is the mechanism which gives us that straight line so that is the evidence I have for the mechanism of nucleation of bainite so in, in two hours you know roughly two hours we have actually covered a huge amount uh, of work we have dealt with what are the differences between bainite and the other transformation and that is really important to understand if you want to design bainitic steels because you can't design just knowing the mechanism of the bainite transformation. So we have the displacive transformations, all of which have a shaped deformation with a large shear component and all of which have no iron or substitutional solute diffusing and all of them have a thin plate shape. Okay. Compare with a diffusional transformation where you must have the diffusion of iron. So it cannot really happen at temperatures below around 500 degrees centigrade. Okay. Well, they become incredibly slow. Um, Wiedemann stern ferrite, carbon diffuses during nucleation and during growth. Bainite, carbon diffusion during nucleation but not during growth. So the reaction stops at the T0 curve. Martensite is completely diffusionless, both nucleation and growth. And here we have the ferrite and the perlite, okay, which must have long-range diffusion, even if it is pure iron. Yeah? You cannot form ferrite in pure iron without the diffusion of iron atoms, because there's no shape deformation. Okay? So now you can understand this really complicated microstructure. Here we have the light etching martensite. This is perlite because look, it's round in shape. Okay, perlite colony. Bainite, dark etching, plate shaped. Wiedemann sand ferrite is white, white etching, and allotomorphic ferrite. This actually is a microstructure taken from the heat effector zone of a, a weld. So you have everything happening at the same time. And I think that is. Uh, uh, that's all for today. So I'll be happy to answer questions. Tomorrow I will deal with uh, properties, how to calculate properties and to relate them to everything we've done today and also to discuss about uh, extremely fine bainite. <coughs> the word carbon strape. I mean, what are the physical differences between the word strape and fusion? Uh, uh, it is the same. What I mean is that the carbon diffuses out from the ferrite and goes into the austenite. So the ferrite form, first forms supersaturated with carbon, mm -hmm. but then the carbon escapes uh, by diffusion into the austenite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same. Yes. What do you think about the habitat formation of austenite uh, on the transformation mechanism from austenite to bainite? Right. Maybe it changed from displ uh, displaced transformation to or diffusion. Yeah. So what was the first part of your question? Uh, habitat formation on habit. Austenite. Heavily deformation, heavily deformed. Heavy oh, heavily deformed. Yeah, very good question. So, what happens when you heavily deform austenite and then transform to bainite? A yeah, very good question. So, the mo growth of martensite, bainite, and Wiedemann sand ferrite uh, involves the movement of an interface, which has a dislocation structure. Okay, anything you do to put obstacles in the way of those interfaces will stop those interfaces. 
So you can completely stop the formation of bainite by first deforming austenite. And that's uh, known as mechanical stabilization. So just like you know, when we add nickel to austenite, you can stop bainite from forming. If you severely deform the austenite, you can actually stop it from forming. And similarly, if you severely deform austenite, you can retard the martensite transformation. So it doesn't change mechanism. It just becomes finer and finer until then you don't get any transformation. Yeah, only tiny, tiny particles. So it's uh, mechanical stabilization. And by contrast, if you look at uh, ferrite and perlite, if you deform the austenite, it goes faster because it's like recrystallization. It's destroying the defects by diffusion. So it, it actually gains from the driving force of the defects in the austenite. Yeah, it's when it's fully austenitic.